so much of my life has been spent in trying to convince people that you really have a problem, especially people culturing cells. And most people, you know, have been in this sort of ignorance is bliss kind of uh, paradigm where if it's growing and, you know, you're taught how to culture cells by your most immediate senior grad student, and if it grows and, you know, the phenol red is turning from uh, pink to orange, don't mess with it. And, you know, that's how literally culture propagation, it sort of takes on another meaning. And so it's been a very, very rewarding journey to work on these technologies. And I'm going to just share with you what we've been doing and where I see the future going. I'm not sure how many of you have heard of UMBC. We are one of the 13 campuses of the University of Maryland system. And this is us right here. We're seven minutes from BWI airport. So once we're all able to travel, our doors are always open. I work out of a former juvenile detention center. So this was acquired by the university and the jail cells are now grad student offices. So that's one of our secrets for being highly productive. Um, so just to take a sort of a philosophical look, sort of like set the stage and perspective. I think we're at the cusp of maybe a good analogy would be 1974 when Motorola first unveiled a brick size wireless telephone prototype. But if you look at how things evolve and you look at just 20 years ago, the innovations that simply didn't exist um you see how this conference today would not be happening but for many of these right so i think our whole field of regenerative medicine personalized manufacturing biomanufacturing etc needs to make that leap and i'm very hopeful that this will happen in 20 years i have a personal vested interest so i turned 60 this year another 20 years i will be needing a new heart very likely and i'm counting on all you 40 somethings to deliver so hopefully the next uh, Tesla or iPhone equivalent in regenerative medicine, there's somebody here in the audience with a gleam in his or her eye that's ready to make it happen. Um, so as I said, it was a long, tough road and it started fairly early, at least in terms of commercializing. One of the things we did was show that you could convert a little cuvette into a bioreactor by putting optical sensors in it. And this now, of course, is now the industry standard. It's the amber system sold by Sartorius. And that's a picture of me holding the cuvette. And this is a little excerpt that shows the original paper uh, that we published in, in 2000. Uh, incidentally, all these references have been compiled, compiled into a book. I will have the URL at the end, but it's also available through SBI's website. Uh, you can go search and it'll take you to a link where you can download this free ebook. So that'll chronicle, it chronicles all the journey that we've sort of taken. So when I set up this uh, Center for Advanced Sensor Technology, I wanted to have a vision which would catalyze disruptive innovation and would be focused on reducing healthcare costs. And under one roof, I was fortunate to have a bunch of amazing colleagues who knew how to integrate optics, electronics, bio, molecular biology, mechanical systems, and really were focused on helping humanity at its core. That's what drives all of us to come up with really low cost solutions that can impact as many people positively as possible. As some of the speakers alluded to, I don't think we're gonna really make a difference if we're charging half a million dollars for a cell therapy. It's got to drop dramatically so that people can actually benefit from it. And so just to switch gears a little bit, what we need to do, and I think someone talked about this earlier, engage the FDA early, and that's really sage advice. And in terms of regenerative medicine bioprocessing, if we can adapt PAT, process analytical technologies, these are tools and systems that can give you consistent process parameter measurements that'll tell you where you are. And basically, with, with uh, you need sensor technology to make this happen. 
Otherwise, it's all qualitative descriptions or driven by modeling. And uh, as was observed, you can make any model work by fiddling with the parameters. That's not really a reflection of reality. And again, Pat has meant different things to different people. And this is the fable of the six blind men trying to describe an elephant, each one concluding that the elephant was a certain way, all of them seeing only a small piece of the overall picture. Uh, so to get to where we want to go and the rigor that's needed to solve this reproducibility problem that several people have alluded to, we really need to get a handle on the process. And to get a handle on the process and simplify things, you really need to get to a point where anything that you're developing, whether it's organoids, whether it's uh, the 3D, uh, the top-down heart uh, grown on a scaffolding or whatever, it's got to get beyond trial and error experimentation all the way um, to first principles. And for that, again, science-based, measurement-based, uh, uh, techniques are going to be critical. And this is something that's been done in the bioprocessing world where empirical database systems have moved to process understanding with critical pra process parameters, critical quality attributes all identified, and a high degree of control. Now, this applies equally to regenerative medicine where the tools of the trade, if you will, in the discovery screening stages, started out with multi-well plates. You moved on to clone selection where T-flask, spinner flask, shake flask were the tools of the trade. And when you started doing process optimization, that would be the place that people would start bringing sensor technology to bear because that was the only place you had sensors. The old dissolved oxygen and pH electrodes were fairly bulky, large, and didn't really work with anything smaller and were also expensive. So the analogy I use here is that you pretty much have ignored your kid all the way uh, uh, through, through preschool and K through 12, and then you start paying attention to them in college and wonder why things aren't quite working out the way you thought. That's pretty much the analogy here because you really pay no attention to the cellular environment in the early stage and then once you've got your cells into the optimization pilot manufacturing scale, you do get the process information, but you have no idea how much opportunity you've lost to improve things. And so we've really been focused on addressing this process information gap. Again, for any kind of CAR T or even bioprocessing, some of these are common in terms of the tools of the trade used. And if you really want to go to a consistent manufactured product, you really need to get a handle on it. So just to step back a bit, if you look at the sensors that were used in the past, most of them were based on indicator dyes. Um, the phenol red continues to be used or conventional glass electrodes and steel electrodes for dissolved oxygen. So now you've got this optical sensor revolution that I was privileged to be one of the early uh, people involved in. And it's really been an enabler for disposables and single use manufacturing. And I'll also sh share with you some of our newer sensor technologies that go completely uh, non-invasively and they're literally out of the box approaches. And I'll walk you through some of that too. So the electrochemical versus optical sensors, the electrochemical tends to be uh, well established, but it needs physical contact. By that, I mean, you actually have to have a probe in your system, so it's perturbing the system. It's also rife with electrical interference problems. It's bulky, it needs to be individually calibrated. Whereas the optical sensors are a through space readout, no direct contact, and the optical system really that we bank heavily on is based on fluorescence and hence cryptolite fantastic was the title I chose. And just a bit of history here. This is one of the classic papers uh, from 1852 on the change of refrangibility of light by G.G. Stokes. And you know, someone asked the question, what can you do without much instrumentation? Gosh, it just shows if you're able to use your imagination, uh, you can do quite a bit. And this is an amazing paper, uh, very entertaining reading for what Stokes was able to do by just 
observing using the light of the sun, light of candle, uh, stained glass windows, uh, solutions of quinine. This is a nod to John's little uh, 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 sort of uh, the tonic water slide that he had. And in fact, historically, this is how fluorescence was first described. And so uh, it pretty much is the basis for all our sensing technologies. And right, let's talk about the dissolved oxygen sensor. It's based on quenching of fluorescence. Uh, we experimented early in the days with a couple of different candidate dyes, and now the one that's being used is the ruthenium one. And what's really uh, enabled it is the fact that we were able to make a fluorescence lifetime measurement. Now, most of us are familiar with fluorescence intensity measurements, where you see this very pretty change in intensity and a different color that comes out. But fluorescence has several properties intrinsically associated with it, and one of which is the decay time. And what happens when a molecule fluoresces is that the light intensity is absorbed and re-emitted with a finite exponential decay time. Now, this is kind of hard to measure with instrumentation uh, because you need very complex gating and timing circuits, but it becomes trivial to do if you sinusoidally modulate your excitation. In other words, just make your excitation source flicker at a particular frequency, and then the emission that comes back comes with a phase shift that becomes very easy to measure. And this then becomes the basis of the oxygen sensor, because what happens is oxygen quenches the fluorophore to a different degree. And by simply measuring this phase angle change, you're able to figure out what the oxygen level is. And what's also neat about it is that you can use very low cost electronics to do this. It's also a very robust measurement. This is one of my favorite slides from my colleague, Professor Joe Lakowitz, who collaborated with me in the early years. And this shows you a measurement of fluorescence lifetime measured as a phase angle, and also a simultaneous measurement of fluorescence intensity. So what was done where you see all these spikes is that the postdoc who made the measurement waved his hand between the sample and uh, the excitation beam. And wherever his fingers intersected the beam, you can see that the intensity goes all over the map, but the lifetime doesn't miss a beat. And so this is our famous hand-waving explanation of fluorescence lifetimes robustness, literally. OK. It works a lot better when I can hear my audience laugh. Hopefully some of you got it. But anyway, um, so the, these compounds, obviously before they could find their way into a biotech application that needed to be sterile, we had to do a lot of work to get the chemistry immobilized so that it wouldn't leach and then the fluorescent components from the medium wouldn't interfere. So this is the generic construction of our oxygen sensor, which also happened to be steam sterilizable. And I'll tell you another little story about it as we go along. It's also very, very pretty. The first time when we started working with it, it was almost magical to go into the lab, turn off the lights, and you watch the LED uh, illuminating the shake flask. So uh, it was literally uh, you know, a light display all the time. So, Shake flasks were our first target because I sort of grew up in the bioprocessing world. It's a high throughput bioreactor, it's ubiquitous, they're used in the millions. And pretty much every pharma biotech or anyone doing any kind of gene expression uh, uses an E. coli culture. And that seemed to be the obvious place to start. So uh, we had this technology and the founder of Fluorometrics, Joe Qualitz, uh, I was one of the co-founders, but he was the business person. He basically came up with the design for the first product. And you can see what's what's lovely about this is that the design hasn't changed much over since, when was this, October 1999, because it worked. And so the idea would be you'd have this patch mounted in the inside of the shake flask sensor. And the other nice thing is that you could then multiplex it and have several readers uh, that can make the measurements. And Fluorometrics then was acquired by Joe Kremenis, uh, saw this opportunity, and he 
started up in, I think, 2013. And so now then Scientific Industries acquired it, and now Scientific Bioprocessing is the latest incarnation of the company, and uh, John is helming it and seeing how he can create further value. So this, again, is a historical video. This is the very first shake fast fermentation in the lab that was being monitored. So it was hooked up to this prototype device. And we have the piece of tape holding the cable because one of our big concerns was that the cable would work itself loose. And so we set up the experiment with a yeast fermentation, 280 RPM. And you know we didn't know what to expect. This shake fast, everyone said, ah, it's, you know, I don't know why you're bothering because these things are vigorously agitated. So there's no issue with oxygen. That's really a waste of time. Uh, don't bother. So I was like, ah, you know, I got to try it anyway. It's so cool. So we started the experiment and my God, you know, my heart sank after about, you know, the 2000 minute mark, whatever it is in hours, because it started reading zero. So I was like, ah, oh, crap, some wires got disconnected and, you know, the whole thing kind of because it's shaking so vigorously, some wires worked loose and we're getting a zero signal. So we're like, you know, let's just let it run, see what happens. So we just let it be and lo and behold, the oxygen crept back up. And that's when we realized that, gosh, mm -hmm. this thing is oxygen limited for most of the duration of the culture. So we said, okay, let's try something where we now decrease the volume and increase the shaker speed. And it was fascinating to see this profile because this is now telling you, and it's on LB media, which is a complex carbon source. And so what's happening is that the cells are adapting to the different substrates. And that's why you see these inflection points. These inflection points are reflective of changes in metabolism. So you're actually eavesdropping into the cell's physiological response in real time. So that was really cool. So this was very exciting. And so we said, all right, let's now try the multiple uh, flask version and see if we can get a handle on what happens with variability. Can we reproduce things that are simultaneously being done? So in one of these, you see an oxygen sensor. That's the conventional glass and st the steel electrode that's stuck in. And so we validated the fact that even during all these points, we were able to actually uh, validate the measurements, our optical sensor measurements with the actual Ingold Clark electrode. So then we said, all right, let's see what happens when you grow cultures under different conditions with different types of closures, whether the shake flask has a baffle or not, and astonishing amount of variability. And if you read any paper, you know, there've been a number of uh, people who alluded to this, you'll see in the materials and methods, overnight cultures were blah, blah, blah. Nobody tells you, you know, the, what the culture conditions were, what the volume of the shake flask was, how much media there was, what kind of closure you used. And you can see enormous variability right there in terms of the length of oxygen limitation that the cells experience. So this was really remarkable. But it's also interesting, the more things change, the more things stay the same. Because this was a paper from Elmer Gaden who observed uh, that a baffle flask is better and a conventional cotton plug is un unsatisfactory uh, without making any measurements, just based on how much uh, the cell mass uh, they were able to obtain. And so we were actually able to make it quantitative. Okay, so now let's just switch gears a little bit and talk about pH. So pH, again, uh, again, someone talked about this. HPTS is the dye we use. Um, I think Powell talked about this earlier this morning, and we actually had to figure out how to get HPTS not in solution, but into a patch. So this was our very first pH patch that was immobilized in a, a polyethylene glycol hydrogel. And what was remarkable about this is it basically like a soft contact lens that we had to figure out how to make it steam sterilizable because that's pretty much was the standard for bioreactors. And then the way this works is it basically shows an uh, excitation ratio metric shift as a function of pH. And this is the calibration curve that you get. We had to do a lot of testing to see the effect of temperature, ionic strength, you know, just grind through the details, see what the interference 
from fluorescent media components was. So do a lot of the validation, and this is almost comical. So this was the first pH experiment. We didn't have a reader at the time. So we basically circulated uh, the, the uh, cell culture, the E. coli broth past a cuvette in a variant spectrophotometer. And so it proved that we were in fact able to accurately measure the, the, the online real-time measurements with offline pH measurements. And again, here also you see towards the end this deviation, that's caused by the fact that when you take the sample out, you're blowing off CO2. And so the sample changes and you get a different pH reading. So anyway, now it's really gratifying to see that it's all widely used commercially. Sartorius study basically licensed the technology from us uh, and um, sub-licensed it from Florometrics. And so all the systems, the single use systems pretty much and GE Healthcare and others use our technology. And so it's widely used in manufacturing and I'm particularly pleased because I've no doubt that many of the COVID vaccines probably use some of these. So it's very gratifying. Okay, so coming back to the early stage process development, we did a number of studies and I'm gonna kind of just fly through these because Jake Boy already told you some of these stories. We basically wanted to see what happens when you passage cells. And so we did several studies and all these are in the uh, uh, book that I told you about. And we were able to actually systematically characterize what happens to cell uh, physiology as a function of passaging and really identify sweet spots where there are regions where cells start shifting to more glycolytic behavior, for example, as a function of passages. And again, this is not surprising because gene expression is very sensitive to the cellular environment. In fact, 2018, I believe, the Nobel Prize was awarded to Greg Semenza and colleagues because they're the people who discovered hypoxia-inducible factor. And really that's something that cells express when oxygen, when they get hypoxic. And so all these cumulative changes cause all kinds of problems. And the way we culture cells in static TFLAS, they're mostly limited. And somebody said, can your vibration of your motor help? Absolutely. So one thing we did, we just put an aquarium pump in the CO2 incubator and it created enough vibration that you would basically avoid uh, limitation and you could actually control the oxygen. And now uh, SBI has released a product that can do that for you. So I'll skip through all this because Jake's talked about it. And also the fact that, oh, this is a piece of history. So we built our first version uh, uh, of the optical sensors and that paper is also in this book to go into a bioreactor. And the reason we did that is I had gone, I was invited by what are today multi-billion dollar biotech companies that were small then in the early 90s and they were struggling to measure oxygen. They said, ah, oh, these oxygen electrodes don't work. Uh, we put two of them in a bioreactor, 30 liter bioreactor, and it's just one's giving one reading, another's giving another reading. So I was like, okay, so what do you tell the FDA? And they sort of uh, said, okay, don't tell anyone, but we don't report it at all. We just keep this for internal use. So they really had a problem and that really spurred the development of this optical alternative. And so again, Jake's talked about this where we've grown astrocytes and neurons and patches and basically take home message is that you may think that your uh, incubator environment is dialed into a particular oxygen level, but because of diffusion limitations, what the cells see is very different. So, Switch gears, we also launched a collaboration with GE Healthcare where they wanted us to develop a non-contact temperature sensor for babies, completely separate application, one of the most rewarding projects I've been involved in. But this took on such a high profile that it brought Jeff Immelt, the CEO of GE to our lab. And Jeff was very impressed and he's like, wow, you know, you guys really know how to do cost reduction. So he funded us to come up with a suite of sensors that would measure glucose, uh, CO2, oxygen, and temperature. And this was the concept. Can we do non-invasive monitoring for babies? Now, I've worked a lot with our neonatal uh, intensive care unit and the physicians there. It's very hard to do these tests on babies because parents of a preemie are traumatized. 
it's really the wrong time to try and get informed consent. But despite that, we, you know, anyone, any parent that we described what our project was trying to do signed on right away. They said anything that'll prevent other parents from suffering the trauma that we've had to go. And again, it's unbelievable. It's a life-changing experience when I went to the NICU. So make your hand into a fist, okay? That's about the size of the baby. And imagine in that fist, you're sticking several needles to draw blood and measure uh, baby parameters like glucose, oxygen, CO2. So it's really, really, uh, you know, heartbreaking to see. And so this was our concept. So I was like, I don't know how I can do enough experiments. And suddenly I had this eureka moment. I said, all right, why don't we put a diffusible surface on a bioreactor? Anyway, glucose, uh, oxygen, CO2, temperature, these are all parameters, whether it's a baby, you know, and I'm an engineer, so I'm allowed to think like this. The baby is basically a bag of cells. And my wife doesn't think that's funny. But uh, if you can figure out what is going on in a cellular system in a bioreactor, it makes the baby sensors go much faster. And so we had this whole class of sensors. These are E. coli and, and many other, they're called the ABC transporter proteins. They're present, Mother Nature evolved them over millions of years to help move glucose and other substrates into the cell. And if you look at the open and closed configuration, imagine picking up a peanut with your index finger and your thumb. That's what's happening. So when glucose is bound, there's a conformational change. And if you put a fluorophore anywhere on this molecule, the local environment around the fluorophore changes and you get micromolar sensitivity. So it's a thousand times more sensitive than glucose oxidase. And because it's not an enzymatic uh, conversion, it's a reagentless sensor, it's completely reversible. So we built the instrumentation for it and we've got sensors that can go in as a dialysis loop into just about any bioreactor and measure glucose and glutamine simultaneously. We have a whole suite of these binding proteins and there's all kinds of uh, IP around this. The other thing we do is also measure respiration rate. So we're able to measure the, I'm gonna try and, and run it as, as an animation because this slide, hopefully it will work. Uh, uh, are you able to see the slide? Yes, we can. Okay, so our approach uses two stages. So you put the sampler against the skin of the baby and you flush it with nitrogen. What that does is give you a zero baseline. And then you flip a valve and then you just recirculate the gas. So what happens is oxygen and CO2 in the blood of the patient diffuses across and is measured by the sensor. So that's what happens. So in a few seconds, you're able to measure the diffusion rate. And if you do the math, the diffusion rate is proportional to whatever the concentration in the blood is. And so of course we were able to build versions of this loop that could go into a tea flask or a spinner flask and effectively non-invasively sample space in a sterile fashion and the sensors, everything comes out of the bioreactor. So from an FDA point of view, it's about as benign as you get. And so this is our prototype T flask sensor. We put in our silicone loop and also put a CO2 patch, pH patch, oxygen patch, and did all the validation studies to show that this is actually measuring as it's supposed to measure. So we now have non-invasive measurements. Now, there's one more issue. Whenever you're sticking a patch-based sensor in a vessel, there's again concerns once you get to the FDA. It's not an issue for R&D, but if you're going into something that's going to go into someone, FDA will want to know all about the leachables, extractables, and then positioning the sensor, et cetera. So we came up with this new concept where what if we just make a diffusible surface in the bioreactor and then you can put the patch right outside a gas permeable wall. It becomes completely non-invasive. Patches can be recalibrated. It's very friendly to regulators. You have full containment. There's no opening of any kind and it's convenient. So we took these view life bags that Joe Kremenis helped me get and we actually mounted a patch outside the bag. And because we had to do the validation, we also put a patch inside the bag and pretty much get the same results. There's a slight lag because of the diffusion, but the cell culture results are more or less identical. So we now have literally outside the box technology. 
while um, Dorothy was talking, she was talking about spending $80,000 on growth factors. It occurred to me that some of you might be interested in the other technology that we've developed in our lab. This is a portable biomanufacturing system funded by DARPA that has recently been featured. And it's a suitcase that can make uh, proteins on demand. So we've actually validated it and shown how you can make GCSF. So it, those of you who are spending a fortune on growth factors might want to invest in technology like this because you could then integrate the production of the growth factors for a fraction of what you're paying for it and add it to your system to help the cells grow and differentiate. So I just thought that might be something of interest. It's one advantage you have as the last speaker. So I was pretty much adjusting my slides based on all the talks that I heard. So that was great. So I'll just end because the time's almost up. Acknowledge all the taxpayers who funded this work. Uh, lots of collaborators, postdocs, students who made it possible. Lots of funding agencies, lots of uh, very generous corporate donors who've supported our work over the years. And again, I'm not implying any endorsement by any of these funding agencies. And this is the link to the free book that I've written that has all this information in it and is sort of a description of this journey, this incredible journey. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs>